Hello, and welcome to my next webinar on C++ Standard Template Library by Example. Despite the name Standard Template Library by Example, today we're going to focus on a topic that's a little bit off the track of STL per se, but still very important to understanding how STL is implemented and how to implement your own generic containers that are similar to STL. The topic we're going to focus on is proper C++ exception handling and exception safety guarantees for generic containers. So as usual, let's go ahead and start. We'll start by having me share my screen, and I'll show you where you can find the code that we'll be covering today. So the code we're going to be covering is in my GitHub repository in the C++ folder, in the exception subfolder, and I've got three underlying sub-subfolders here. One called no exception safety raw, one called no exception safety template, and one called exception safety. So we're going to look at them in that order. So let's go ahead and take a look now at the code. Here I am in my C Lion interactive development environment, and you can see I've defined an array class. It's really just a stripped down version of a vector. And I'm using this for illustrating the exception handling capabilities in a fairly controlled way. But what I'm showing you are very powerful techniques. First, however, we're going to show you kind of a really simple minded stripped down version where we're just going to have an array of characters. I type def care to T, so it'd be sort of generic, but it's an array of characters. Down here, you can see that we actually have the implementation of this being a size underscore data member called that's of type size T and an array underscore data member of type T star, which of course is a care star. The constructor is going to copy the size parameter into the size underscore data member, and it's going to go ahead and allocate a new array of characters of size size and store them in the array underscore data member. We then have a destructor, which goes ahead and deletes the array underscore data member. So when the object goes out of scope, it'll clean the memory up. And that's where things get tricky, as we'll see when we get to the next version. Here is the copy constructor. Remember, the copy constructor gets used whenever you are going to copy one array to another. So the copy constructor gets used here. This is just the array constructor with the size parameter. In this case, we allocate an array of size 1,000. We then allocate an array of size 10. And then we copy the contents of the array of 1,000 into a new array, of, which will then also be a size of 1,000. And that's what calls the copy constructor. We also have some calls down here to use the assignment operator as well. We'll look at that in a second. So here's the copy constructor. The copy constructor looks very simple. We make the size underscore data member reflect the right-hand size, the right-hand side size underscore method. We make the array underscore be a new dynamically allocated array of characters of right-hand side sized underscore. And then we have a little loop that goes for i equals zero, i is less than right-hand side size underscore and we copy the contents of each element in the right-hand side array into the left-hand side array. No must, no fuss. You never have to worry about an exception being thrown when you're copying one character in one array into another character in another array. Character-to-character -character copies won't throw exceptions. Let's take a look at the assignment operator. It does something very important. It checks for self-assignment. You never want to assigned to yourself because you'll end up deleting yourself and cause all kinds of trouble if you're not careful and it's just extra work that's unnecessary. If we are assigning to ourself, then we're gonna go ahead and just return star this immediately without doing any changes. And we do a check for self-assignment by seeing if this object has the same address as the right-hand side object's address. If it doesn't, we're not assigning to ourselves. So what we do in this case is we then allocate a new array of characters of rhs.size underscore. We store that into a temp variable. We then run through a little loop and we copy each element in the right-hand side array into the left-hand side temp that we're doing. And then we're, when we're done with all that, which will also not throw an exception because character to character copies don't throw exceptions, we delete the old array underscore because we're getting rid of it. And then we go ahead and assign it to the new temp. So that's the way the program works. Let me go ahead and show you how to run this with Valgrind. So if you go over here and we go into no exception safety raw, I've already pre-compiled this code. I run it, it doesn't do anything, which I don't expect it to. I run Valgrind, which is a cool memory leak detector 
program. And what you can see what it does is it checks to see if we leak any memory, it checks to see if there's any memory corruption. There's not, we didn't have any exceptions, everything worked fine. So you might think you just uh, to yourself at this point, hey, I've got a pattern for writing con containers. Well, you actually don't, but we'll talk about that in a second. So to illustrate why we've got some problems, let's take that very same code, except now let's replace the use of this type def of a care to something that's a template. So we have a template type name key array. So type name T could be whatever we want it to be. It could be int, it could be double, or it could be something pernicious like our dreaded throw exception struct, which we'll see in a minute, throws an exception and wreaks havoc on our implementation. But we'll come back to that just in a moment. Down here, the implementation is going to look very similar. We have a size data member and an array data member of type T star. So it's, it's a pointer to an array. And what we do in the constructor is we do exactly what we did before. We copy the size parameter into size underscore. We copy a newly allocated array of size, size of type T, generic type, into our array underscore. So far, it looks good, but we're just uh, treading on thin ice here. The next thing we do is we go ahead and do the destructor. The destructor is going to delete the array as an array, which is correct. But this is where things get murky. Take a look at the copy constructor. Remember, that's the one that's used when you pass by value, you return by value, you do an initialization. The code looks identical, but there's one big important difference. We copy the right-hand side's size to the left-hand side size. We make a new array that's the right size. We put that into the array underscore data member. We have the same loop as we did before, but the big difference is because we now have a template, that template's assignment operator might throw an exception. And if it throws an exception, we're in big trouble because the rules in C++ are that destructors are never called unless the body of a constructor finishes. So if a constructor throws an exception before it's being finished, before you hit the close curly brace at the end of the body of the constructor, the destructor is not called because of course the compiler has no knowledge of how far you got in the initialization in that constructor. So it doesn't want to just willy nilly delete things that may not be initialized properly. So in that case, we're going to end up leaking memory because the destructor is not called. We allocated this array of T here and it's not going to be released. So that's a problem. Likewise, if you come down here and take a look at the assignment operator, similar kind of problem. We come in here, check for self-assignment. Let's assume we're not doing self-assignment. Down here, we're going to go ahead and allocate a new array of type T of the right size, put it into a temp. And then we're going to go ahead and run that loop again, just like we did before. Except this time again, when we copy the right-hand side's array underscore sub i into the temp sub i, the assignment operator of type t could throw an exception. And if that happens, well, we're out of luck because we allocated this memory and it's not going to be free. So that's a problem. Um, let's assume we somehow magically get through that loop without throwing an exception. Same rules apply. We delete the old array and assign the temp to the, to the array. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what, what happens in practice if we run this code. So let's go back over here. And now let's go up to no exception safety template. And again, we're going to run a.out, which I pre-compiled. And now it catches a range exception. Why did it do that? Where did that come from? Well, if we go back up here and we take a look at the throw exception struct, I told you that mischievous struct that's going to cause havoc and insanity on our code. You can see that its assignment operator, after being called 10 times, throws an exception just for testing purposes, just to demonstrate the problem. And we do that by having a static int. We just increment it each time it's called. So when we run this code, we get an exception. But more importantly, when we call valgrind on this code, it's going to tell us we've leaked memory. And that's because when the exception was thrown, that naked pointer was not deleted, and so we leaked it. And that's a bad thing. You do not want to leak memory in C++ programs. It causes all kinds of problems down the road, especially for systems that have to run for a long time, or, or embedded systems, or real-time systems where you have to conserve the resources. And any system that leaks memory long enough is going to become a problem. So how do we fix this? Well, there's various ways we could try to fix this. We might come in here and say, oh, I know, I, I know what I'll do. I'll put a try catch here. So I'll say try 
And then down here, I'll say catch, and I'll say standard, out of range, exception, ref, ex, and I could say something like delete array. And that will work, but there's two problems. Number one, littering your code with try catch blocks just gets ugly, quite frankly. Sometimes it's important, don't not catch exceptions because it looks ugly, but there's a better way to go. And secondly, whenever you put try catch blocks in your code, you're gonna end up in a situation where you're going to have to have the compiler generate some additional code, which makes it slower and bigger in order to manage the exceptions. So let's try to come up with a way to do this that does not require this exception handling, explicit exception handling. And the way to do this is shown in this other code project called exception safety. And as it may imply, it's exception safe. We're gonna have that same bad throw exception struct as we did before, but this time we're gonna outsmart it and keep it from causing trouble. Here's the code. Now, at first glance, the code looks the same. It's, it's a, an array, it's templatized by type key. A lot of the code looks the same at the beginning, but there's one really important difference to start with. Instead of having a T star array underscore data member, we have a unique pointer that's specialized with an array of T. And unique pointer is a standard STL class. And if you look at the implementation, it basically holds the contents that it's passed in its constructor using the famous resource acquisition is initialization idiom that C++ uses in so many different places. And if we pop down here a bit and we find the destructor, which is the little tilde character down here, you'll see that the destructor will delete the pointer when it's called. So that means we're always going to end up deleting the allocated memory, even if an exception is thrown. Because of course, the way that exception semantics works are that the destructors of data members that are properly initialized will be called even if the main destructor for the class is not called if the copy constructor doesn't fulfill its, its uh, purpose. So let's take a look. Here is the array constructor that takes a size T and makes us a new array of that many dynamically allocated items. But array underscore now is going to be this wonderful unique pointer so it'll clean itself up properly. We don't actually need to have a destructor so we just give it the default to say, you know, compiler, you, you do your thing. We don't need to have any special destructor here. Here's the assignment operator. It looks very similar to what we had before. Uh, in fact, it looks identical. We allocate a new array of type T of size RHS size underscore. So that's the right-hand side size. But that's a unique pointer now. So even if an exception is thrown in the code below, that will always get deleted. And lo and behold, down here, we have that loop like we did before. Because we have a unique pointer, we have to say, array underscore dot get sub i as opposed to array underscore sub i that's just the semantics of unique pointer but the good thing is that even if an exception is thrown here the destructor of the unique pointer will clean up that allocated array so that's good now the second thing to remember is no self-respecting c developer these days would ever write this kind of code they would more likely use the stl algorithms like the copy algorithm where we start at the beginning of the right hand side array, go to the end of the right-hand side array, and copy it into the array underscore data member. So that's kind of the, that's our STL part of this lesson, is just showing how we could use the algorithms here. So that's kind of cool, but the really cool part is the assignment operator. So let's take a look at that next. So here's the assignment operator. As before, it does the self-assignment check by checking to see if this is not equal to the address of the right-hand side object. And let's assume for sake of argument it's not, so we can actually have to make a copy. In that particular case, we do a much shorter implementation, and this is a really cool idiom. Very, very widely used, used in implementations of STL, of course. It's just the way to do things these days. And this will give us what's known as strong exception guarantees. There's several different types of guarantees with exceptions. You can have no guarantees, which say leak memory like we did with our no exception safety template version. You can have weak guarantees, which is what we do up here. And that just says, I don't leak memory, but I don't make any assurance about whether the object state is preserved in any sensible way. It didn't matter in the copy constructor because the object didn't exist yet. So the fact that its state didn't get preserved doesn't matter because it didn't exist. But for the assignment operator, it does have a state. It does have a left-hand side. 
And we wanna make sure that if an exception is thrown, that left-hand side is left unperturbed. We don't want it to be corrupted or, or modified in any way. And that's what's known as strong exception guarantees. And the final type of exception guarantee is called no throw. And we'll talk about that in a second. So here's the idiom. You can use this pretty much for every assignment operator that you write in this form. It'll give you trivial, strong exception guarantees with no try catch blocks, which is so cool. And the way it works is we use the fact that we have weak exception guarantees for our copy constructor so that if an exception is thrown in there, no memory is leaked, which is good. And once we've got our temporary copy of the right-hand side created here, that's all this is, we're just making a temporary copy of right-hand side, we then call the swap method defined below, and we swap the fields of the temp with this, or rather star this, which is the left-hand side. So what'll happen if you look at swap, we take the right-hand side's size, size T met, uh, val value its data member, and we swap it with our uh, size underscore data member, copying size T's never throws an exception. And then we also go ahead and we swap the unique pointers, pointers. So swapping pointers also will not cause an exception. So this is a no accept method. Swap is no accept because it won't throw exceptions. So it's got no throw semantics. That's the strongest form of exception safety semantics. And in this case, it costs us really nothing. We're just swapping the, the fields. So when we're done here, the original contents of this, which is the left-hand side, will now reside in the temp object. And when it gets destroyed, its array underscore data member will automatically get its pointer freed. So it'll, it'll basically free the old left-hand side's array underscore pointer. And the temporary's copy of the right-hand side's contents, which will be its temporary array underscore pointer, will get swapped to this and its unique pointer. And so that will then be in the right place. So we basically just swap the pointers and that won't throw an exception. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens when we run this code. We'll go over to the exception safety folder. When I run the code, which I've already pre-compiled, you can see it throws an exception just like the previous version. But unlike the previous version, if we run Valgrind on it, you'll see that when it runs, it does not leak memory. So that's the beauty of this approach. We don't leak memory. We don't have any, you, you don't, you'll notice there are no try catch blocks anywhere in our implementation of this generic array. So this generic array container, this generic container has strong exception safety guarantees, doesn't leak memory, doesn't corrupt its, its state without using try catch. And I think that's pretty darn cool. So those are the topics that I wanted to cover today. Uh, what we'll talk about tomorrow is we'll get back to STL and uh, its features. We're going to be looking at the, the ordered associative containers tomorrow. That'll be things like sets and multi-sets and maps and multi-maps and so on, which is really, really cool stuff. I think you'll, you'll get a great deal out of learning about that. But for now, you know a lot more about how to implement strong exception safety guarantees very simply with a very simple pattern, and it'll allow you to write your code in a way that won't be corrupted without littering your code with try catch blocks. So thank you all very much for watching. If you like what you're seeing, please like and subscribe. And also please feel, to follow, feel free to follow me on Twitter. If you go to my playlist description box, it has my Twitter handle. So thank you and I'll talk to you again soon.